I just love that testimony that he is faithful. You know, he is faithful through the mountains and through the valleys. And uh, what a, a great song to set up our series. And so uh, if you're joining us for the first time, maybe online, uh, we are studying through the book of Ruth. And what I mean by studying is, is we're opening up, we're picking it apart, we're seeing what each chapter holds for us each week and the principles and the lessons that we're learning from those things and how can we apply those to our life. And what are, the, what are these principles tell us about God? And how does this uh, God interact with us still today in 2021? Because uh, Ruth was written thousands of years ago, right? And this is an Old Testament piece of Scripture. And what does this look like now as a New Testament piece of Scripture? And uh, Ruth chapter 3, uh, to me, is, is one of the more obscure chapters. I believe Ruth is a little obscure, right? And then Ruth chapter 3 is kind of hidden and nestled in there. But I believe it can speak to us here uh, this morning. And I'm excited about it. It. Uh, any uh, uh, Bulldog fans in the house? Yes. All right. Uh, anyway, I know I'm in Clemson country, but that's okay. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good weekend, you know. One year. Come on. Give me one year, right? Uh, it's, it's been a while, 1980s. But uh, anyway, excited uh, to be here this morning. Thankful that you are here. Uh, and I just want to pray for us. Ask God to speak to us during this time. Today, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles, we're going to have it on the screens for you as well. But Ruth chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 13. So Ruth chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. We'll also spend a little time in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. But we'll be there in just a few moments. We'll set this up together. Uh, let's pray together here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much. I believe that each and every person is here on purpose, God. I believe that you have... Uh, uh, divinely intervene. Anybody that can hear my voice, God, uh, I believe that you have set up this time. You have appointed this time. And as we read through the book of Ruth, uh, God, that you are faithful, uh, even in the moments of tragedy, the God that you are faithful uh, to walk with us, that your presence is still with us, God. I pray this morning that you would speak through me, God. I pray that I will decrease so that you may increase. I pray that uh, your word would just come alive to us, God. I pray that you would reveal things in us and through us, God, that maybe we've never seen before and that we would walk in surrender to you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Uh, well, today the title of my message is choose wisely. Choose wisely. And uh, because uh, did you know that the average person, this is kind of crazy, it may blow your mind a little bit, but the average person makes 35,000 decisions a day. A day, our mind is processing that many decisions. Should I open the door? Should my left hand go? Should my right hand go? Should I turn this way in traffic? You know, all these micro decisions, but we also have bigger conscious decisions that we make, right? I just want to break this down a little bit. Uh, that, that is 2,000 decisions per hour. And that is also a one decision Every two seconds. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just our minds and the way they work and uh, the way we interact with each other and interact with the world around us. That decision after decision. No wonder my mind is exhausted by 6 p.m., right? Like, no wonder. And I, I love that because uh, there are some very real things that go on in our brain and in our minds. And one is, uh, they call it decision fatigue. Whenever we make that many decisions, our minds actually uh, begin to fati fatigue. And they, they did a study. This is pretty interesting. This is not my notes. This is all like free, right? But in my, uh, they did this study where they, they observed judges. And as they made decisions, they noticed in the morning they were 65% more uh, apt to give better judgment or more grace towards the person that's in the courtroom. By the end of the day, it was almost 0% chance. Just the decision fatigue in the human mind and human brain. They also call it, uh, for us, uh, we, like this, we like choices, right? In our world, I mean, think about it. Uh, we can stream, we can turn on Netflix or Hulu or something and it's not just like old school, what I call it, right? Where you turn it on and the cable uh, company picks what movie you watch, right? Like from, and it's only a time period from 9 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. Like that's it. That's all you got. No choices. Just that one right there. I guess you have the choice to turn it off, turn it on, right? Um, or turn it to the next channel. But now we have choices. I mean, 30,000 different movies. Have you ever got on there before? This has happened to me. And you can't decide. 
Like, you know, you're like, just, I'm not going to watch anything. You know, like, there's just too many choices. I can't decide. Uh, and they call that, um, that the paralysis, right? The analysis paralysis is actually what they call it. It's because there's too many choices. And when that happens, usually what they tell you to do is narrow it down to maybe three. So okay, out of these three choices, uh, which one would you want? And then our minds uh, are, are better apt to make a decision in that. Well, I think about all of those different things all of those different statistics, uh, because decisions are real. And, we, and obviously, we make a ton of them every single day. Some of them small. Some of them we probably don't even realize we're making them. But some of them are big decisions, right? Like, where, what job do I take? How, should I accept this much money? Should I not? Should I interact with this person? Should these be my friends? Should I go to this college? All of these different decisions can be big. Well, if you're like me, I like to have filters. And it's like the Bible gives us these filters in which we can live our lives. It's, it's almost like if we're trying to make a decision, here is a filter in which how to make this decision. Should, is this a godly decision? Is this, what, is this God's plan for my life? Probably the number one question that we ask ourselves is, God, what is your plan for my life? What is your will? What is going on around me? And we have these filters to help us make those godly decisions because sometimes it can be heavy and sometimes we want to know what what does my creator say how have you wired me how do we interact with this together and i believe chapter three illuminates this and we can see this in the characters our main characters here in ruth chapter three and just to to kind of catch everybody back up we have uh naomi right and so naomi and ruth both walk through a tragedy within 10 years naomi loses her husband and her two sons. And so now she is left with her two uh, daughters-in-law. One goes back and kind of gets released and she starts her own new life. But then Ruth says, you know what? No, I'm going to be loyal to you. I want to stick to you, Naomi. Your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. I'm following you. I'm here with you and for you. And that was in chapter one. And we see how God worked and intervened in that. And then they go back to uh, their home country. And which represents she was going back to God. She was seeking after God. She heard that God was moving there. And so she wanted to be there. She wanted to be where God was moving in the midst of those people. And so her and her family go back there. And now uh, Ruth goes and she is trying to get food for her Naomi. And she's working in the fields and she just happens, right? So just by chance or by circumstance, she comes across this man named Boaz. And come to realize Boaz is related to Naomi. And that's going to be big here. We're going to notice it a little bit today, but even next week, how, uh, how vital that is and how God intervenes in those details through all of that. And so now, uh, Ruth has been working in the field. Boaz sees Ruth. Uh, they strike up this friendship, and Boaz goes above and beyond, right, compassionate and with kindness and helps her out. And then now, uh, we see a plan begin to take place, okay? Uh, we see that uh, Naomi realizes that Boaz and Ruth Ruth have struck up this friendship. She also realizes a little bit about the law and how these things can all play together. And I wonder if Naomi kind of sits back and goes, I see what you're doing, God. Okay, now I see. I couldn't see it earlier because I was just in a tragedy. Honestly, maybe she didn't know which way was up or which decision was right. And God, why is this happening? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, God, through the tragedy, is still working inside of her life and working inside of their family. And so we see this. And this is where we pick up uh, here in Ruth chapter 3, verse 7. And I, I, just to, to show you this, because I love this, I find this pretty hilarious. Is that Ruth or Naomi goes to Ruth and she says, you struck up this friendship. Now, Ruth, have you ever thought about that this could be a a chance that God brought you two together? And that if you two get married, not only will you have a new spouse to do life with, but there he is what's called a kinsman redeemer. And because he's related, now uh, you will receive all the family line blessings that you would have gotten before. And so we see this play out. But uh, this is where this is the part that I find intriguing. Uh, Naomi, she, her being wise, right? She goes, OK, Ruth, this is what I want you to do. Look, I want you to go take a shower. OK, clean up, put on some nice clothes. 
clothes, put on some perfume, you know, like, like do all of that. Get cleaned up. Look good, right? Because you're about to go talk to Boaz, right? And then I want you to go. But this is the part that cracks me up. She says, I want you to wait until he is eaten. And he has had something to drink, okay? So that he's in a good, he's been working in the fields all day. And then I want you to wait though, because wait till the evening. Let him eat, okay? Like you, I, she knows the way to a man's heart, right? Like let him eat, let him have some drink, let him rest, and then go. I want you to go talk to him, present this idea, present this, uh, that you are interested in him to him. And I, I just find that hilarious. And then this is where we get to uh, uh, verse 7, uh, because she asked Naomi to go and it was tradition for uh, the female to come. And as the man was laying down to come, the woman would come and lay at the man's feet. And that would represent, hey, I, I, I want to show you that I want to offer my life. I want to serve you. I want to be together with you in this. And so it's, it's kind of, it sounds very odd now in our culture, and our tradition. But for them, that was something that they normally did. So verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7. You guys still good? All right, it says, after Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, see there, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman laying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I mean, think about it, right? Like, the Bible is entertaining. I mean, at midnight, you wake up and somebody has uncovered your feet, right? And laying at your feet. Who are you? What what was happening here? And then it says, I am your servant, Ruth, she replied, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now, don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. That's going to be important later than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning, I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. As funny as that is, and kind of out of the box as that is, uh, that was part Part of their tradition. And one of the filters, if you've noticed, all the way through the book of Ruth, uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, they have this particular filter in their life that they make decisions. But one of the things that I notice about this is Ruth was an answered prayer for Naomi and for Boaz. And we're going to see that Ruth was an answered prayer not only for Naomi, not only for Boaz, but for generations to come. By her following and seeking after the Lord, by her taking a step towards God, God used her even after her tragedy. I know for me, a lot of times when I walk through hard times or turbulent times where I feel like I'm in the valley, it can feel like, God, can you even use me anymore? God, can, can, can I even be used? Can I even make a difference? Or I'm too broken. I'm too hurt. My mind is too far. God, I'm, I'm too drained. I'm too exhausted. God, you, I don't even know if you can use me. And let this story be a testimony to you and I that even in the midst and after tragedy, God can still use us. He is still faithful. The the fact that he is using Ruth and that his faithfulness doesn't depend on my actions, right? But yet he is still faithful. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that is an encouragement to you and I to know that all of that weight doesn't rest on my shoulders. My responsibility is to take that weight off and lay it at the feet of God and say, God, how, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know when you're going to do this, but I am trusting that you can still work in this midst. God, I am trusting that you can still rearrange and reorder and make something out of this mess. God, you can make something out of what's going on in and around me because maybe you came to church or you're listening to me and you just feel like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that is still possible. I don't know if God can still use my story. And I'm here to tell you he can. 
And it's the moment that we place it in the hands of Jesus, the moment that we give it to him, that he starts to work and intertwine in those moments of our lives. And we're going to see here a little bit later some some of those things that we can do in our lives. And I also believe that each and every person that can hear my voice, we have an opportunity to be an answer to somebody's prayer. We have an opportunity by walking in the will of God. Maybe God places on your heart to be generous to somebody. Maybe God places it on your heart to walk in and to forgive somebody at work or to forgive a family member, whatever that may be. God uses us to be an answer to that situation or to that problem. We have things coming up like our Thanksgiving serve event and somebody could be at their house right now going, I don't have enough money to provide Thanksgiving food for my family. And then all of a sudden they get to drive through and and you're standing there smiling, right? Like, here's some turkey. Here's some stuffing, right? And all of a sudden, you're an answer to their prayer because of your willingness and your uh, a chance and opportunity just to be available. And we don't have to carry the weight of God. Can you align this? I need this person in my life. I need this to happen. I need, and it's just me being faithful and following God's plan. And he starts to bring the right people in the right place. And we have an opportunity to be an answer to the prayer of those who are around us. We have an opportunity. How much purpose is that every single day? One of my prayers, uh, we're, uh, some of our small groups are reading uh, the book called Draw the Circle. And one of my favorite prayers in there, one of the days it talks about is, is Lord, surprise me. Lord, surprise me. I, God, I'm, I'm here to follow you. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. And if that's a surprise, if that's something different, then God, just surprise me of how you're working in it. I love that, right? Like, it's just I wake up today, God surprise me. You may put somebody in my path. You may give me a word to say to someone or whatever that may be. And all of a sudden we, we see this begin to happen. But I think about our daily lives. And, and to me, I call that the thrill of obedience. It's just this thrill of knowing that the creator of the universe is working behind the scenes and he is always working to connect those dots in our lives and in our hearts. And so uh, as we see that, sometimes uh, I believe it can be hard. I'll say, "Okay, God, how do I walk in that? How do I uh, walk in that filter? And what is the filter that we see Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz walk into? How do they live their lives? What do they do? What does it look like? And for me, as I see this over and over again, I see this theme that all three of them are, are committed and hunkered down to following in obedience to God's plan. They surrender themselves. If you notice, they even Boaz, I I love this part of the verse. It says, um, stay here tonight Uh, in the morning. I will talk to him. So he's saying, yes, I I want to marry you. But in fact, there's another person. And actually, he is closest to kinsmen to you. And he is a closer family redeemer than I am. He could have in the moment said, no, no, let's go try to hurry. Let's try to rearrange. Let's do this, do this in secret. Let's, let's go behind the scenes and just try to make this happen on our own power. But they said, no, this is what God's law says. This is what God's plan is. This is God's way. And, and if we believe that God, this is God's plan, then we want to do it his way, not my way, right? And so he says, we're going to follow that in obedience. I love that, right? Like to have this opportunity. And I picture, picture the traditions here in, in Ruth. And uh, we even see this, that where Ruth submits to Naomi, even in the partner that she chooses, right? Even in who she's going to marry. Because Boaz says, I'm a little older. You could have went and picked like a young buck, right? You could have picked somebody, right, that your age and y'all could have been traveling and holding hands and skipping and all these different things. But you chose me. It's because Ruth sought the heart of God. And God said, I am aligning this. And if you will trust me with your life. I know what's best for you. I know what's best for that. I know what's best for my will. And if you're willing to follow me and follow my will, I will align those things inside of your heart and inside of your life. And if we look at this, this is an Old Testament principle, right? Because now we're New Testament Christians. I mean, Jesus has come and he fulfilled the law for us, right? So do we walk around and try to uh, adhere to all the 600 plus laws of the Old Testament and try to do what Ruth did and Naomi did? But no, Jesus came and fulfilled that. So how do we interact with that in our relationship with God? What does that look like? And the good thing is, is Jesus taught us. 
Jesus was teaching his disciples. In John chapter 14, he says, this is what it looks like. And in fact, he goes into a three chapter, John 14, 15, and 16 string of teaching how to interact, how to experience God. And he's teaching on the Holy Spirit. He is saying that once you become a believer in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. We read that in Ephesians chapter 1. And he's saying, now you interact with the Holy Spirit. You yield to the Holy Spirit, just like Naomi, Boaz, and Ruth was yielding to uh, the plan of God in the Old Testament law. Now the Holy Spirit guides us in the heart, guides us in the ways that God has called us to. And and he shows us this here in John chapter 14. And he says a couple of things here that I I think we can pick up and we'll land the plane after this. But John chapter 14, verse 5, Jesus is teaching, and this is what he says. If you love me, Obey my commands. I love the simplicity of this. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Wow, what a a beautiful picture. He's saying, if you love me, then follow my commands, obey me. But he says it has to be, if you're taking notes, here's the first one. Our actions, our obedience are rooted in our love for Christ, in our love for God. That we love because why? Christ first loved us, right? We love. That is the structure of my life. And the only reason I know what love is, is because God is Love, And if it were up to me, I may have a different definitions or when my emotions are high or when I'm angry or when I'm sad or when I'm tired or whatever it may be, it can it can warp my thinking a little bit. Right. If we're honest with each other. But God is saying, look to me for the standard of love. Look to me and how to interact with those who are around us. Look to me at how to love yourself. Of how to find who I have made you to be. Your identity. And it's through that. Through that love. Through that love of Christ. Of seeking and wanting to know him. Now I can truly love others. Now I can truly know what it means to love myself. To understand that that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. To know that I walk as a redeemed one in Christ. And that there are little things that maybe I don't like about myself. But God said, I made you that way. For a reason. For a purpose. And I'm moving and working in the midst. And what a beautiful picture. That you and I don't have to carry the weight of God. How to figure love out. He's saying, no. Focus on my love for you. And follow me in all of that. And then he continues on here. Another point that I want us to to get here. It says, if we love God, then we will follow his plans for our life. I love the. I'm going to get extremely simplistic in this. And then a quick challenge here as we close together. But I love this. And it says, uh, this is a uh, quote from Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And if you know Bonhoeffer, he was around World War II time. In fact, he ended up giving his life because he was uh, going against Hitler and World War II and all those different things. But uh, he's written many books. This is one of his quotes. It says, faith without works is not faith at all, but a simple lack of obedience to God. I love that. I just think that the that, that, that faith without works is not faith at all. In fact, it's a simple of I just need to be obedient to what God has called me to do. And the fact that I'm placing my faith in Christ, the fact that I trust God with my life means that now the way that I live my life is reordered and restructured to God's plan, to God's purpose in my life and in my heart. And here's another quote. I only got two quotes for you today. Okay. It's okay. Uh, but this This one is so good. Uh, This is by Craig Rochelle. It says, I believe Christians often perceive obedience to God as some test designed just to see if we're really committed to him. But what if it's designed as God's way of giving us what's best for us? To understand that he knit you together in your mother's womb. He is your creator. He knows, okay, Dave and Deborah are going to be, Daniel, Amanda, I know, Miss Sin, I know that you are fearfully one of me. This is how I wired it. And if you will follow me, if you will follow my commands, you will come to see that's actually how I wired you to live, to live the abundant life 
as he describes in John 10, 10, to live life to the full, to experience him, to experience full love of joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. That's why I believe it is so contagious. And the Bible talks about the fragrance of heaven. And when we live and act in obedience to God, the world looks at us and goes, wait a second, that, there's something to that. Something in me, I feel like there's a void. I feel like I, I'm not feeling that. And what is that? And we're able to tell them that it's actually God's design for my life. It's God's design for your life as well. And we can experience him in another level. And then here's, here's the last thing here. And then I want to give us one more verse. Uh, it says here in John chapter 14, this is the part of love. And it says, I will love them when we follow in obedience to God, when we surrender to his plan. It says, I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. What a picture. God is saying when we walk in love to Christ, he is saying, I will reveal my who wants to experience God in their life. Who want the creator of the universe? It's, have you ever sat back and said, God, I just wish he would reveal himself. I just wish he'd put the writing in the sky, right? Well, he did you one better. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. It's come in the flesh. He left heaven and walked this earth and died on the cross for you you so that you can experience him every single day. And this scripture, this promise says that if we love him and we follow in his ways and we submit to his ways, then he will reveal himself to us. That we, in fact, experience God on a deeper level. We know God on a deeper level when we exercise our faith. When we commit to him and say, God, I'm going to be obedient to your plan. I'm going to be obedient to your will, to whatever is going on around me, God. And when I do that, we experience God. We see him work inside of our lives and inside of our heart. I want to leave you with this verse and kind of a challenge for us uh, as a church. And we're in this 40 days of prayer. Uh, Psalms 37 verse 5. And this is an incredible. It's, it's so simplistic but yet so hard to do. Don't you just love verses like that? That are just, just like, wow, this is amazing, right? I just wish I could do it every day, right? But it's Psalms 37 verse 5. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. What a promise. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. That last three words, when I've been reading that this week, I'm a pacer when I pray. And I was pacing. I was like, God, you will act. It doesn't say that he may act. It doesn't say that he may show up. It doesn't say that he may interact. He may reveal. No, he says he will. He will. We can stand. That is a promise from the word of God that we can pray, that we can hold on to, that if I commit my ways to the Lord, he will act right I can put my trust in him every single day because he is moving in the midst and we see this in the book of Ruth she every day right Ruth commits her ways to God and he starts aligning the right people right he starts aligning her steps all she's doing is submitting and committing right okay i'm going to commit i'm following your plan in this i'm following your plan in this i'm following your plan in this and when i looked up the uh, original language for the word commit it means to roll away or to roll down i thought wow like to to set in motion. Have you ever tried to do a front flip down a hill? Right? Like if you ever like, I know we're getting like my bones are starting to creak a little bit as I get older, but my kids, you know, just to just to roll down the hill, you have to commit, right? Like yeah, I am all in. But what I love about it is this to set in motion. You can't roll something and it be still, right? It actually has to move. It has to work. It has to move forward. You and I, the Bible is showing us, commit yourself to God. And when we commit ourselves to God, we're showing that we are trusting in him. We're trusting in his plan. We're trusting in his ways. And he will act. Amen? So as we think about that, as, as I close and 
We're going to continue to sing and worship together. But my, my question to you in your life and to my life, honestly, as I begin to pray and evaluate, God, what do I need to commit to you? And, and for you and I, it's a, it's a daily. I'm waking up today. Today is Sunday, right? October 17th. God, I commit this day to you. It's Monday, right? Guess what? A living sacrifice. You know what the problem with a living sacrifice is? It keeps climbing off the altar, right? Every day we have to say, God, you know what? Today is your day, okay? I commit myself to you. God, today is Tuesday. I'm tired. I don't know what to do. The people at work are driving me crazy, right? But God, I'm committed to your ways. I can't really see how you're working all the time. God, but I'm holding on to this promise that you will act. That you will grant me peace. That you will walk with me through this valley. That you will work with me in this moment. God, I am committing and I'm trusting you. Because on the backside of that, one is we get to experience the creator of the universe. We get to experience God when we commit ourselves to walk in obedience to him. And two, our story becomes a testimony in the lives who are around us going, I can't. How, how, how did that happen? It looked like all hope was lost. It looked like it wasn't going to happen. It looked like that all that this was not even going to happen. And all of a sudden, it's like, I know we committed ourselves to God. We committed our marriage to God. We committed our uh, raising our kids up, right? Like we committed to going to work this way. We committed these things. And God began to act in and through what is going on. And all of a sudden, our testimony is not directed towards us. We say, all I did was commit to his ways. All I did was follow in him. And he began to act inside of my lives. He began to act inside of my heart. And for what I have realized as a pastor over the years, that faith compounds. Faith builds. And maybe for you, a faith step for you is, you know what, I'm going to read the book of John today. Or maybe not today. I'm going to read the book of John. I'm going to read this chapter. Maybe a faith step for us is I'm going to go and look. If I'm going to reorder my life to the obedience of God, I need to know how God wants me to act, right? So I'm going to go read the Gospels. I'm going to watch how Jesus interacted with people, the, the way he taught, the way he interacted with people. I'm going to go read the Gospels, and that's my faith step. But I'm, I'm willing to take that step, right? I'm committing. I'm rolling, right? I'm, I'm all in, God. I'm committing this to you. Maybe it's the, the time of prayer. I'm committing to that God. I'm committing. Maybe uh, you've been praying, you've been following God, but you've never, because uh, our church is also doing a, a fast right now. Uh, we're encouraging people to pick one day during the week. Uh, I'm doing Tuesday. It starts at 6 p.m. and ends Wednesday at 6 p.m. It's just one day. It could be uh, you're fasting from your phone, TV, food. If you're going kind of that uh, biblical fast of the, the food route, whatever it may be. Uh, but it's the opportunity for me to go on. I'm taking this away so that I can commit my time. To pray into you, God. I can commit my time. I can refocus, replan, and say, God, work inside of my life. Whatever it is, my heart, my hope is that what is that that you need to commit to God? Maybe it's an area. Maybe it's in your entire life. Maybe it's whatever it is. I, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would speak to you here today and that you would trust in Him, that you would take Him at His word. I am fully. 130% confident by standing on his promise, right? I can confidently stand up here and say, if you commit your ways to him and trust in him, he will act. I don't have any reservations about that, right? Because these aren't my words. I'm just the mailman showing up going, Let, this is what God says. This is what his word says. Here it is. And I can stand on faith in that, not because of it's just, just words, but it comes from the very mouth of God. So 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness to know who God is. I told you I was closing. I'm closing now. But we're going to pray together and just ask God to speak to our hearts. And maybe for you, maybe you're listening online, the first step of commitment is saying, God, for the first time, I'm fully committing my life to you. 
I've never actually give, said, Jesus, I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. I, I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you are my Redeemer. I believe that you came to save the world. And when those who place their faith in him and believe in their heart that he is Lord, that he is our Savior, he is faithful and he is just to save those who are around us. And so my heart is that you would make that decision today. And if you have questions about it, I would love to talk with you and to walk with you through that. There's a link online if you're looking at that as well. Uh, but for everyone else, maybe uh, what is that? You begin to pray and ask God, God, what is my faith step for me? How, what do I need to commit to you in my life and in my heart? But let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for this moment today, God. This beautiful moment where uh, we get to hear your word, that we get to come together and just encourage each other to walk with each other, to challenge each other, to pray for each other, God. God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts. I pray for each and every person who can hear my voice, God. I pray that uh, here in this moment that they would surrender one their lives to you if they've never done that before. Maybe their step of obedience is to go public with their faith. They've never gone public and, and said, I, I want to be baptized in your name, Jesus. Uh, I pray that for that over our lives. God, I pray that maybe there's an area of our life that we need to commit to God. And I pray that you would reveal that and you would speak that truth over our lives. Maybe it's pursuing you in the word and reading the gospels and, and opening our eyes to what your word says for us, God. God, I pray that you would give us boldness to do that, courage to say, God, I trust you. I'm going to commit this to you. God, I pray uh, that you continue to move and work in our lives. I pray that you will reveal yourself to us, God. I pray that as we draw near to you, you continue to draw near to us. I pray that we seek you wholeheartedly, God. And I pray that you do what only you can do. That is change lives, God. That is work behind the scenes. That is supernaturally begin to stir things in us, God, in which you created us for. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.